Hello. It has been a long time, but I um, decided to make a quick video today about outliers and talk about the least you can do without changing software packages or changing your modeling approach. So this is based off of kind of a beefy review paper I just did about heteroscedasticity and looking at type 1 errors and power when you have outliers. And there are different types of heteroscedasticity that I looked at. So, oops. And the way I looked at that here is um, these are residual plots. So you can have a univariate outlier in the explanatory variable, which is shown here. I don't know why when they published this, my points all came out as squares, but whatever. Or you can have a univariate outlier in the explained variable. I like, I like using, uh, this came from somebody who I worked with, and he preferred calling them explanatory and explained variable, which I like. Um, so I'll be using that here. And this is the worst case scenario, the multivariate outlier, because they're outlying both in the explanatory variable and the explained variable. And heteroscedasticity without outliers, uh, this was inspired actually by some behavioral data analyses I was working on with somebody. And although I did see this, I have seen this in fMRI data, they were not... Um, uh, something's happened and I don't have access to those data anymore to analyze and look at this effect. But anyway, so these are residual plots that you would normally look at if you're running a behavioral analysis and you're assessing the assumptions of your model. And typically that's where we catch this in regression. But of course, with whole brain fMRI analyses, the big problem is we're kind of blindly running a ton of analyses, you know, 100 to 200,000 regressions. And our hope is that the p-values we're getting at the end of the day are okay. And it's really asking a lot from any model. So here are the models I'm, I covered in the paper, and I'm gonna talk more about robust regression in another video, I think. So I looked at two different approaches. One of them I was really hopeful was going to work well, um, which was kind of what motivated this project, but it turned out it only works well if you have 800 observations. 800 subjects. Um, I also looked at uh, ordinary least squares, which is your standard model in SPM. And uh, many of the algorithms in AFNI are also based on OLS and permutation tests. Now, an interesting result from this that was surprising is that the permutation test always matched OLS. In other words, I, I think we're under this assumption that permutation tests are this magic um, bullet to fix all the ills of our data, and they really aren't. So I'm going to have a whole video about that to talk about permutation tests and what that mysterious exchangeability assumption really is, and um, hopefully give you some ideas to think about when that assumption is violated. And I looked at Kendall's rank correlation as well, which has its limitations because... It's only looking at um, non-decreasing relationships, so it's harder to interpret the results. And then flame one from FSL and flame one with the outlier detection also from FSL. Uh, I should, I'm a little sniffly and I apologize. I have a little bit of a cold. Anyway, so those are the, the models I looked at. I'm not going to go into great detail about any one of these right now. As I said, I'll come back to robust regression in a different video. So now I'm just going to quickly go through each of the primary results. The top is uh, type 1 error rate, so the goal is to land between these dotted lines, and the bottom is power, so the goal is to be really high. So this is univariate outlier in the explanatory variable, so this is your in your regressor. And the x-axis is the ratio of the outlier to the non-outlier standard deviation. So uh, it gets uh, pretty, pretty high. So... Um, the good news is all except the doubly robust, by the way, this is the one I was hoping would be the winner and it's, it's actually more or less the loser in most cases. Um, mostly everything controls, uh, type one error just fine. Oh, one last method is just trying to use Cook's D in an automated way to throw out subjects that look like outliers. This just never works well. Okay. So type one error is pretty well controlled. You get the most power out of the flame approaches. Um, the orange line is underneath the, the green and the yellow, and OLS. So OLS does fine. The uh, robust regression approaches 
have like a slightly less power, but nothing to, you know, fret about. So pretty much here, univariate outlier in the explanatory variable, you don't have much to worry about unless you're using uh, Kendall's tau. And then that hit in power, and even then it's not that bad, five, six percent. But again, as I said, there are limitations to that. So what if it's in the explain variability? Now, the other thing I did not explain, which I probably should have, but the outliers can be driven either by the within subject or the between subject variance. So as I've shown in previous videos, the variance, because we're using hierarchical model, uh, the within subject variance is, you could think of that as the variability across run within subject average across the runs and between subject variability is just the between subject variability so um, within subject variability the flame one approach for example both of these they're automatically weighting the subjects by their within subject variance or using a variance estimate that incorporates that so they're always expected to perform best if the outlier is driven by the within subject variance and you can see that type one error is pretty much fine for everybody except for this one that always craps out. But the power is quite a bit better for the flame one approaches, uh, especially compared to OLS and even a little bit of a boost in power. Again, maybe this is only around 5% compared to the robust regression. When it's in driven by the between subject variance, that's where this um, flame one with outlier detection is supposed to help with that. And something seems to go wrong with that when the outlier gets really strong. Um, but otherwise, if the outlier is not too strong, not too bad, OLS, the green line, and the flame approach is do pretty well compared to the robust, like slightly higher power. Again, nothing to get excited about. It's just when the outlier gets really huge that there is a big difference and flame one has a lot less power than the robust models. So this is not a new result. That, um, this was shown by um, uh, Wager and I think Lindquist a while ago, this result. But I will point out an outlier of three standard deviations from the mean, even if you just flip through your data, an FSL view or whatever viewer you have, you should be able to spot a subject that's that huge of an outlier or if you have multiple subjects. So. In a sense, if you're using uh, these models with lower power when you have outliers, you could repair the model by um, running the regression with and without those outliers. And I realize I'm adding to the number of models that you're running, but um, yeah. You report both, by the way. I would never run both and then uh, not report it. Uh, the bivariate outlier, this is the worst case scenario because for type 1 error rate, when it's driven by the between subject vari variance, all the methods fail. When it's driven by the within subject variance, as expected, the flame approaches do quite well at controlling the type 1 error rate because they can automatically fix the bivariate outlier. So this is, as I said, the worst case scenario because if it's driven by the within subject variance, nothing fix fixes it. Uh, between subject variance, uh, oh jeez, get it straight. Between subject variance, nothing fixes it. Within subject variance, you have a chance with flame one. Um, so since type one error is not controlled, we don't look at power in this case. So of all the examples I'm showing you today, this is the most troublesome because up until now, the worst case scenario is you take a slight hit in power, or here it's it's more of a substantial hit in power, but you should be able to look at your data and see outliers two and a half to three standard deviations from the mean. But here, your type one error rate's inflated, so that's a bigger issue. But this is a bivariate outlier, meaning the outlier is outlying, that subject is outlying both in the regressor value and the explanatory variable and the explained variable. And I understand it's hard sometimes to look at your fMRI data but it's pretty easy to visually inspect all of your regressors and look for outliers that way. Uh, this is the header scedasticity without outliers case. The simulations were a little bit wacky, but um, this just shows that uh, robust regression can fail to control type one errors. It wasn't that bad. Um, 
a little bit and then power differences. I don't really want to spend a lot of time on that example. Okay, so is OLS the worst? Now this is my opinion. I don't think so. If you're just looking at your data, you're probably going to be fine. Um, outliers that are huge, you're going to see them if you've just flipped through your data. You can do this in FSL view. You can look at the time series view in FSL view. You can look at residuals. I believe both SPM and I think all the software packages will output residuals and you can view those in a viewer and see what they look like. And running the model with and without outliers to see if those outliers had any impact, um, I really don't see much wrong with that as long as you report both models. So no, if you're using OLS, I don't think it's the worst case scenario. Is robust regression the answer? Again, this is my opinion. I don't necessarily think it is. I think when you're using robust regression, you really have to pay attention to the weights. And this is what I want to talk about in another video. And I think this is often overlooked. Um, just shortly, I'll say that I was helping somebody who was studying depression scores in a behavioral data analysis, and it ended up that all of the really highly depressed subjects were being downweighted to the point that they weren't included. So now you've changed your hypothesis in terms of the study population that the results apply to. So more about that later. Um, Right, and I, I said this again, I'm, I'm not really on board with just automatically throwing away subjects that are outliers. Um, like I said, I'd run it with and without them. I'd try to figure out why they're outliers, um, if it was something to do with the data collection, if it is a real value, or if maybe the subject didn't understand the questionnaire. Uh, whatever you do, if you are going to use some type of a threshold, set it before you look at your data, then analyze your data, and make sure you report both results if you run with and without outliers. What's my favorite approach? Um, I still prefer the flame one because in many of those scenarios, if the outlier is driven by the within subject variance, it can catch that. So... And I kind of like that. And I like that the weight in that case, this within subject variance, it's estimated from the first level model. So there are quite a few degrees of freedom. It's a pretty good estimate. It likely does reflect something unusual about that subject, as opposed to robust regression, which is using the residual um, for that subject, which is a little different. It's just one number from one observation. And again, I'll talk about that more. I do I don't hate robust regression. I think it, it can be useful. So I don't want that to be the message. Um, yeah, and of course this doesn't need to be your favorite model, but I do see that it has a lot of benefits compared to the other ones. And it's already built in to the software. So what is the least you can do? Well, nothing can fix a bivariate outlier. Not, even if you're a big robust regression fan, it's not going to take care of that. You have to manually remove those subjects. But the good news is all you have to do is look at the distribution of your, your explanatory variable, which is just one, you know, one column of numbers. So you can easily look at histograms or box plots, you know, whatever you want, and inspect it. And if you have a subject with, or a few subjects with really high values, do consider running the model with and without. That, that is the one situation where it is very easy to justify why you're removing those subjects and putting them back in because they can inflate your type 1 error rates. Again, that was the only case out of all these scenarios that type 1 error was inflated. Otherwise, you're just hurting yourself with power. So the least you can do is make sure you're not in this category of a bivariate outlier. If you get down to the univariate outlier is your worst case scenario, you're in a much better place. And I spelled univariate wrong. So that's all I have to say. Um, just look at your regressors. Please join the Facebook group or follow on Tumblr or Twitter or all three and have a great day.